Hey everybody, it is Cal and Nitro for Nitromaniac TV's Wrestling Unlimited coming at you today with another by request Nitro's take. And this one has been in uh, about a few years in the making. Uh, when I first started the channel back in 2017, my art guy, Ryan Heinrichs, uh, sent me a uh, basically a request on events that he'd like to be seen. Uh, reviewed or taken a look at on the channel and I said once I develop a formula for these shows uh, I would execute it um, so this is about well, 2017, 2020 three years in the making -ish, uh, right now, three, four years in the making uh, but today we're going to take a look at the ECW on Sci-Fi pilot it aired on June 13th 2006 uh, on the United States on the Sci-Fi Network and uh, that started the WWE ECW run on Sci-Fi. Um, at the time Sci-Fi was S-C-I-F-I and by February 16th, 2010, the final episode of ECW on Sci-Fi, Sci-Fi had rebranded to S-Y-F-I. If you're as confused as I am, get in line. A lot of people are confused right now for that. Uh, so the final episode for WWE ECW, again, February 16th, 2010, the big thing coming out on that show was Vince McMahon walking out and basically saying ECW was no more. The new show would be rebranded as WWE NXT. And thus we have the NXT brand that we know and love today. So it's, it's hard to believe that that brand is actually over 10 years old in different iterations, but didn't really start picking up steam since, or until I want to say about 2011, 2012 ish when they moved to full sale and started doing uh, programming from there. But anyway, this is about WWE ECW. <clears throat> Right, so a quick history lesson. On May 25th, 2006, WWE announced the launch of ECW as a standalone brand uh, congruous to both the Raw and SmackDown brands. So this was going to be the third brand on WWE, uh, or sorry, of WWE programming, I should say. Now, the initial plan for this brand was it was to be a 100% developmental brand. Uh, Shane McMahon kind of rolled with this idea in a creative meeting and started putting the WWE started putting the coals to the idea I should say uh, to have ECW as a one hour uh, streaming on WWE.com once a week brand uh, basically to compete with what was going on on the indies at that time you had TNA Impact on Spike that had just debuted that fall that was getting some big numbers uh, you had uh, Ring of Honor shows that were uh, in demand amongst the tape traders and that stuff. So the plan was to take the hot talent in OVW and uh, Deep South Wrestling at the time and kind of kind of bring them in on this ECW brand and let them kind of you know do their own storylines and, and create their own thing and put them in front of WWE's mainstream audience a little bit and also bring back some of the old names from the past. You know your Tommy Dreamers, your Sandman, stuff like that, and kind of in a old its own way relaunched ECW brand. Now I should say before the beginning of this, this by far is not the definitive piece on the ECW on Sci-Fi pilot, nor is it a definitive kind of top to bottom balls to the wall piece of, uh, you know, the brand itself. For those, there are some links to some great reviews below. Uh, OSW Review did a good one. Wrestling Regret has done multiple pieces on uh, WWE, ECW, and talent emanating from this movement uh, in the past few years or so. So the links are below on that. So after you're done watching me, gladly give those guys a watch and a support and a like. So anyways, come with me as I tell you the tale of basically a build to WWE Vengeance, which was going to be the next pay-per-view after ECW One Night Stand in 2006, which kind of got kicked off softly on Raw the night before. Don't forget this was a Tuesday night back in the day. But it really started building and matches really started to get built big time uh, on this edition of ECW on Sci-Fi. So that's one bit of it. So we have that uh, tale. We have 
what seems to be a really creepy tale now, if you take a look at it in the back, of Kelly Kelly's debut in WWE, which uh, she was 19 when this show aired, um, which kind of adds to the creepiness of the whole deal. And a big battle royal at the end of it all to see who would face John Cena at Vengeance. So this was... A loaded show from top to bottom, so let's take a look at it. And this is what I thought, you know, watching it through 2020 eyes. The show opens with a recap of ECW One Night Stand 2006. This was the pay-per-view from the previous Sunday, uh, set to the theme song for ECW on uh, Sci-Fi. I want to keep saying ECW on TNN. No, it's not. It's ECW on Sci-Fi. Uh, bodies by the group Drowning Pool. Uh, we did watch a recap of Monday Night Raw, stating that John Cena will show up tonight after getting his revenge on Edge somewhat the night before on Monday Night Raw. Basically what happened the night before, well, John Cena walks out on Monday Night Raw and uh, basically tells the audience that, hey, ECW thinks they can show up whenever and whatever. That's cool with me. I'll see you tomorrow night. So guaranteeing it, he's basically saying, hey, watch ECW. I'm going to be on it tomorrow. So uh, major hooks, major eyes kind of focus this was the big news in the wrestling week that week was the launch of this so basically after the opening vtr we see the show open and we hear justin roberts by the way the first time we have heard justin roberts on wwe television in a brand this was his first gig was wwe ecw he may have done some announcing on velocity and on uh sunday night heat and that stuff in the past but not in a continuous role, but this was his first full-time gig with WWE. So this is uh, the, the start of arguably one of the best uh, voices in ring announcing that we have seen or heard uh, since Howard Finkel re retired. And, of course, earlier this year, Howard Finkel had passed, uh, passed on, passed away. So uh, Justin Roberts is, you know, one of the legendary voices now in wrestling over the past 10 or 15 years for ring announcing and that stuff. And one of the guys that I think a lot of guys and girls try to emulate now. But anyways, Justin Roberts froze to Paul Heyman and he is marching out to ringside with a black bag. What's in the bag? Uh, Taz and Joey Styles are your commentary team. And Paul intros the new WWE champion, Rob Van Dam, who of course won the WWE spinner title. Uh, the WWE title at the time that spun <laughs> uh, at ECW's One Night Stand 06 by cashing in his Money in the Bank contract. Edge interfered in that match, took Cena out, and allowing Rob to hit the five-star frog splash for one, two, three. A great match, and uh, actually that pay-per-view is off-the-wall bonkers. It's the legendary If Cena Wins We, we Riot pay-per-view. Uh, it is a classic so go check that one out if you haven't had the chance to do so so this actually is a very strong promo and the crowd in trenton new jersey is mostly behind him uh paul presents rob with the rechristened ecw heavyweight title and rvd says he will keep both belts because one is the ecw title and look at this one it spins <laughs> that was kind of the, the joking point of the promo um, yeah, so at this point, uh, Rob Van Dam is a dual champion all of a sudden, anointed the ECW champion for ECW on Sci-Fi and the WWE title as well. All of a sudden, the music hits and Edge and Lita make their way to the ring. Edge is the number one contender for the WWE title at the upcoming Vengeance pay-per-view. Like I said, this is now the build for Vengeance is full stop rolling. Uh, it was one of the bigger pay-per-views of 2006 as well. Uh, Edge says they have a lot in common, both former Money in the Bank winners, both cashed in successfully, and says it will be an honor to face Rob at Vengeance. Uh, then a spear by Edge, and he mocks RVD with his pose and leaves through the crowd. But as Edge and Lita are leaving through the crowd, having their, made their statement, uh, John Cena emerges, and the brawl ensues. Uh, once they get back to ringside, RVD pushes Cena off Edge, but Edge fights off both Cena and RVD. And they all take off through the crowd once again through the same little hall or uh, aisleway. But on the way out, Cena basically does a drive-by on Paul Heyman, who's kind of standing off to the side and just decks him. Uh, and the three of them kind of bail out, and Cena takes off through the back. Now, Heyman was the guy who had counted Cena's shoulders to the mat when the referee was incapacitated after the five-star at ECW One Night Stand because 
uh, once again, Paul Heyman was not only an ECW representative, but he was a WWE official as well as the ECW head representative, kind of a power figure. And so this entire segment is one of the best segments of 2006, in my opinion. It is a amazing kickoff to the brand. Um, yeah, it's focusing more on, hey, this is what Vince wants for the pay-per-view. But this is stronger than anything that was on the previous night on Raw. It was stronger than anything that you'd see on SmackDown that week. Uh, it, this was the biggest and best opening segment, uh, I would say, of the year in 2006. Uh, I think that it was really a strong opener, and it kind of gave you this unpredictable feeling that they wanted to convey with uh, WWE ECW at the time. They fade to black for commercial, and then when they come back from commercial, Heyman is in the back, uh, rallied around by the ECW wrestlers. And Heyman kind of states, how dare Cena screw ECW like this? He states that ECW will invade Monday Night Raw for retaliation the next week. And we head back to ringside, and we go into match number one of ECW on Sci-Fi. So for an opening contest for your brand new ECW band, uh, brand, who would you feature? Uh, ideally, looking at it in 2020 eyes, you'd maybe feature a maybe a stalwart of the company taking on uh, of the company's past. Maybe somebody with some name or, or something taking on, uh, you know, maybe a relative unknown, and maybe that unknown gets a pinfall on a stalwart or something. Or maybe you have two young guys like AEW did with their first show, uh, like uh, with the, uh, the the matchup on the the pre-show for Double or Nothing, their very first pay-per-view, uh, where they had, uh, I think, after the Battle Royal, they had a one-on-one -on -one match between Sammy Guevara and Kip Sabian, kind of show off the young talent for that company and say, hey, these guys are going to be the future. Um, they didn't do that here at all. <laughs> the, the first matchup, of course, is the infamous ECW zombie take on, uh, taking on the Sandman. And, of course, the zombie was a stab at sci-fi and sci-fi executives. Um, they basically were doing this inside joke for weeks on all of the WWE programs where um, in the midst of the, like, for example, in the midst of the DX feud with the McMahons, you'd have... A, somebody dressed up in an alien costume uh, walking around in the background or something and then, you know, kind of imitating Vince's walk until Vince yells at the guy in the alien costume and he slumps off and walks away. Uh, this was another stab at it. Uh, in coming weeks, we would get Macho Libre, played by Tony DeVito, uh, which was a stab at Nacho Libre, which was one of the, the hot movies of 2006, the Jack Black character. Um, you know, this was just um, a real cheesy, cheap attempt at basically kind of poking fun at sci-fi at this point, and, which is... Not necessarily wise, considering you're back on the network, or you're on the network, I guess, and you're trying to uh, imp like impress the network execs. But they probably figured that at the time, wrestling, again, was getting monster ratings every week. So this, no doubt, would have been one of the higher-rated shows, regardless of what happened. I mean, Vince could have slapped ECW on the side of somebody's um, dog, and have just a GoPro of the dog walking around for 45 minutes, and that probably would have pulled back then 2 million views just to see what the dog was doing because, uh, you know, it was affiliated with WWE. Uh, wrestling was kind of going through a mini resurgence in the mid-2000s. Not a huge one like it did during the, the uh, Attitude Era, but the shows were definitely, for the most part, watchable. Uh, this, though... Yeah, looking back at it in 2020 eyes, not necessarily the best television. It's super cheesy. So the zombie was played by a developmental talent by the name of Tim Arson. And Arson had done some job duty uh, for WWE on Sunday Night Heat in the weeks prior. And uh, showed up on uh, ECW television as the ECW zombie. This is his only appearance as the ECW zombie as his character walks to the ring. Uh, grabs the mic and for many cuts the promo of the year maybe it's the promo of the decade uh, it could be maybe the promo of the century 
we don't know because we don't speak zombie and all it is is just roaring to human ears at least in the fun internet ways of internet culture and that stuff in the mid 2000s or so we named it the promo of the year in 2006 uh, basically under the gist of you know nobody speaks zombie so we don't know who or what he's referring to it could be you know a promo calling out John Cena or it could be you know a declaration for president or something uh, we don't know or it could be the most profound statement of our life uh, maybe he found a cure for cancer I don't know but anyway uh, it is a uh, very humorous moment and it is an infamous moment in WWE lore uh, and uh, Tim Arson's name will always be associated to that moment uh, to fans of a certain age and a certain era so Anyways, uh, the Sandman music hits the brand new generic uh, guitar biddle, as OSW would call it, uh, instead of Inter Sandman. And the crowd kind of goes mild because, again, you know, half of the Sandman's pop and entrance is Inter Sandman by Metallica. And of course, WWE did not get licensing until, well, basically now to use any Metallica song. Uh, as we've seen recently with the Boneyard match and that stuff. Um, and even that had to had cost WWE a pretty penny to license that music uh, in perpetuity to, uh, you know, show that. I mean, recording this right now, uh, they just came off of a SmackDown where it was the Undertaker tribute on SmackDown basically the night before. And um, it is... They did a replay of the Boneyard match, and that match basically uncut just kind of cut to make room for commercials uh still had the metallica track uh from uh, hardwired to self-destruct it's the song title is not coming to my head right now but anyway uh it is probably a pretty penny to license that for a perpetuity and for a lifetime license i don't think it's a lifetime license i think it's probably hey you can use it for as much as you want for the year and then after this certain date, after a year out from WrestleMania, uh, you got to start paying us X amount of dollars or something. Uh, who knows how they brokered it. But, uh, you know, it's it, it definitely... And especially after ECW 2005, where uh, the One Night Stand, the very first One Night Stand in 2005, uh, where they actually had Inter Sandman uh, as the music for the Sandman, and he walked out with it. Uh, you know, it's... Um, it's quite surprising, really surprising that they didn't even bother. But uh, it seems like this was a, uh, you know, Vince knows what he knows. And this was not something that he knew. <laughs> he did not know the ECW brand. He just figured that this was going to be, at first, a developmental brand. And then I don't know what he had planned for this prior to it stopping and going to NXT. But anyways... So this match, though, is rather short as the Sandman treats his in, uh, the uh, ECW zombie as a pinata, basically, the wax him around with the kendo stick, and then the white Russian leg sweep for the one, two, three, and the Sandman wins with the Duke. Uh, 14 years later, you watch it, and it's like, what the hell did we just watch? Uh, but I did have to laugh with the amount of dust coming off of the zombie when he bumped for the leg sweep. Uh, that was just unreal. It was like pig pen. And, uh, yeah, that was the end of that segment. It's one of the most infamous segments in WWE history. Go check it out if you have not watched it, if you are a younger viewer. And if you're an older viewer, you know exactly what I'm talking about, but go watch it again anyway. It's, it's cringeworthy and it's funny at the same time. We didn't see a promo in the back of a debuting Kelly Kelly. Again, she was 19 years old when she made her debut in WWE with this. Um, the, the whole thing is about 20 or 30 seconds long. Basically titillating the view of the uh, viewers to watch later on so just you know just beating the hook and reeling them in head off the commercial and then we get the classic return from commercial that's a wwe trope let's shoot the exterior of the arena that we are in tonight <laughs> on the outside and so uh, we see the exterior of the sovereign bank arena so the sovereign bank arena is now the cure insurance arena in trenton and it is a 10,500 seat arena, according to Wikipedia, as I just kind of take a look at this here. Opened in October 6th of 1999. So, and its first event, guess what? A WWE event. But uh, it is used now currently for 
uh, trying to see if there's a team that's basically college basketball is where it is. Basically, it's 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 basically used for college sports and college athletics. We then roll a package to a, another flashback from the 06 uh, One Night Stand pay per view, uh, basically um, foretelling the story of Jerry DeKing Lawler versus Taz. It was the opening match on the One Night Stand pay per view, and apparently Lawler was pissed on how this match went down. Taz got the win with Taz Mission. It wasn't very long, it was maybe about 20 seconds or so. Joey Styles is involved in it. Um, you know, and it was, I think the whole thing was Lawler was pissed off at Taz at his physical condition at this point because Taz had been out of the ring for some time. Lawler basically was working every other weekend in Memphis, so uh, did he have a right to be pissed off? Maybe. Was he more pissed off that ECW was uh, being brought back into the WWE fold because of his vocal dislike of ECW, basically? and how the company initially didn't really want to work with Lawler's uh, USWA and what was going on uh, with the CWF in Memphis and that stuff at the time. Uh, that could be a part two, so, you know, politics. Second match on the show, Kurt Angle versus Just Incredible. Angle just assigned to ECW, fresh off of beating Randy Orton at run One Night Stand. Uh, credible, basically, enhancement talent here as WWE tries to get the wrestling machine gimmick over for Kurt Angle. This was, I think, going to be a fun gimmick for Angle, but, uh, of course, he really took it t when he got released by WWE to TNA, and it exploded over there. It was over big time uh, with that kind of no-nonsense, this guy's a legit shooter-type gimmick. And um, if it wasn't for the uh, drug abuse problems that Kurt had at the time, I think that this gimmick probably would have been the start of Kurt's resurgence back up to the top of the card on either Raw or SmackDown. I think we would have seen him probably back on the main roster, it, a clean Kurt Angle with that gimmick uh, within a year or two. Instead, he goes to TNA and becomes one of the big names over there uh, for about half a decade or so. Angle, though, keeping it amateur here, and he wins with a choke after a headbutt. And I love the wrestling machine music uh, for Kurt Angle here. It's a very underrated theme, but Angle, again, is on the way out. They basically remixed Angle's theme, and uh, I really like this track. This track is awesome. Angle then grabs a mic, says it doesn't matter the rules. He will make Orton tap out in their WWE rules match at Vengeance. Yes, there was a rematch between Kurt Angle and and Randy Orton uh, from the ECW One Night Stand match. Uh, Orton basically walked out on Raw the next night and complained that, hey, uh, of course Angle won. It was no disqualification. He couldn't beat me in a normal wrestling match. And so we got the greatest wrestling match a good 14 years before Orton and Edge did the same thing at Backlash. Lots of things going on during the show here, so we'll keep it rolling. Uh, Paul Heyman in the back announces the Extreme Battle Royal, all weapons legal, winner gets John Cena at Vengeance. So that's right, the winner of the main event tonight in the Extreme Battle Royal will take on John Cena at Vengeance. Uh, back to the pre-tape promos with Kelly in the back, and she says she's going to show us her assets going into a commercial break and then coming back out of a commercial break another exterior shot but then you look in the lower corner and it's the debut of kevin thorn uh the former mordecai basically uh unleashing the vampirist gimmick on us and um you know boy did that, that gimmick uh kind of fizzle big time by the time uh ecw december to dismember uh rolled out that pay-per-view maybe we'll talk about that one one day it's generally considered the worst pay-per-view of all time and another wwe trope is hey we're halfway through the show let's recap what happened in the opening segment uh and we saw the recap of earlier tonight uh virtually verbatim again uh so they were filling time like nobody's business padding it out i think this recap goes about three or four minutes or so and for more padding of time, send Kelly out there. So Kelly Kelly makes her debut next. Of course, she was just known as simply Kelly at this point. Uh, the legend behind this segment is she, of course, was basically hired out of a swimsuit catalog or a magazine or something or doing glamour model shoots down in Florida. Um, Johnny Ace hired her. And 
they wanted to bring her slowly into the fold, so put her on ECW again, one of the young developmental talents. They didn't realize how young, but there you go. And, um, you know, just basically, this was the type of woman that they were bringing into WWE at this time. But legend has it that she had no idea how to dance uh, at all, let alone dance seductively at all. Again, only a 19-year-old model here, just basically either in college or just out of college. And so Vince McMahon in the back, uh, along with, uh, I think, Johnny Ace and maybe a couple other people, uh, actually showed her what she needed to do. <laughs> so uh, if you can visualize uh, Vince McMahon attempting to dance like um, the stripper at the corner strip club, <laughs> there you go. It's it, it's kind of humorous to take a look at, but uh, that's what happens. And so, so watch the segment. Uh, it's cringeworthy in 2020 eyes. In 2006 eyes, it was jaw dropping, but in 2020 eyes, it's like lol. Uh, watch for the bra botch here, as she couldn't get the bra off during the number as well. Um, so it's just kind of just kind of hanging there. It is. Um, it's kind of an auspicious debut for uh, a woman that actually would be fairly influential in WWE storylines and that's for the late 2000s and into the early 2010s. Um, I would think that if somebody of her ilk made the debut today, they would be thrown right into NXT and they'd probably be, you know, better suited for WWE entertainment and that stuff and that style of pro wrestling. Uh, than she was here, obviously. I think that that's, it, it's an obvious given. It is main event time. It is the Extreme Battle Royal. Here are the participants up next here. Uh, Tommy Dreamer, Sabu, Al Snow, Roadkill, Danny Doring, uh, Stevie Richards, uh, the entire FBI uh, kind of tandem, the, the freesome of little Guido, uh, Tony Mamaluke, and Big Guido. Uh, and their brand new valet trinity from is fresh off of uh total nonstop nwa tna at the time total nonstop action uh trinity the full-bodied italian uh she her wwe run didn't really last that long i think she was with the company for a little less than a year or so and then kind of fizzled out and and i think after this we didn't see her in the wrestling business at all right after i think she might have just uh, guy out of it but um, yeah this was her run in WWE as the female valet for the full body or sorry the full blooded Italians <clears throat> Balls Mahoney and Big Show uh, are the final participants here and this is pure Big Show cleaning house um, there's <laughs> this of course is an all weapons are legal battle royal so there are a ton of unprotected headshots here it's it, it's comical uh, Al Snow is the first one eliminated, followed by Doring. Uh, Big Show is, again, the guy who's eliminating people. Uh, Stevie Richards is eliminated by the Big Show. Roadkill by the Big Show. Balls Bahoney by the Big Show. Uh, Tommy Dreamer gets thrown outside through a table and eliminated by Big Show. Uh, Guido and Mama Luke are gone by the Big Show. This is all in about six or seven minutes. Um, the crowd mildly reacts for a standoff between Big Guido and Big Show. But um, the exchange is rather lackluster after. Um, for the finish of the match, we finally get to the finish. Uh, Show eliminates Big Guido, but Guido holds on to Show's arm. And this allows Sabu, who had been uh, kind of dumped outside of the ring early on. He, one of the old gimmicks where he got, went through the ropes and not over the ropes. Uh, Sabu comes in from behind and nails an Arabian splash on Show's back. And Show eliminates him, uh, or and uh, or sorry, Sabu eliminates Show. I should say, um, it's very similar to the way that Chris Benoit eliminated Big Show from the 04 Royal Rumble. And is that, uh, you know, it's basically Show's arm getting locked up by somebody. In this case, Big Guido, and something from behind basically prope propelling him. Uh, whereas with the 04 Royal Rumble, it was basically shows momentum hauling him over, allowing Benoit to be the last one standing on the apron. Um, and this one, it was, well, Big Guido's on the outside, and Sabu just kind of comes in and 
nails him with a splash, and that's enough momentum to send Sho over. So your classic super heavyweight heel elimination, and Sho looks pissed off of this. So, um, you know, firmly established as a heel here is Big Show. Uh, this is so comical to watch with 2020 eyes, though, and it'll be Sabu versus John Cena at Vengeance, and Sabu stands alone as we head to Black and, you know, find out more later on. So one of these days I will sit down and take a look at the Vengeance 06 pay-per-view because I remember that one being actually very good. It was a sleeper pay-per-view of 2006, but it was up there with the One Night Stand and the WrestleMania pay-per-view and maybe even the Rumble from that year as one of the top four pay-per-views of the year for sure. Um, I will give the ECW on Sci-Fi Pilot a 7.5 out of 10. I think, like I said, the opening segment is one of the best things WWE has done all of 2006 television-wise, uh, just for pure intensity building and pure brand building. Um, there are, again, the comical tropes in with this, uh, the stabs at sci-fi, sci which are um, kind of gets a nauseating in the next, or over-nauseating, I should say, over the next few weeks. And, um, you know, like I said, notable for so many reasons, too. The debut of Kelly Kelly in the WWE, uh, rather auspiciously, though, um, and so on and so forth. So anyways, that's it for me. Uh, later days, happy wrestling watching. I'm Kelly Nitro. We'll talk to you next time on Nitromaniac TV's Wrestling Unlimited. Take care.